Hello everyone, I'm Hartford HealthCare's Tina Verona. Thank you so much for joining us. I am here tonight alongside Dr. Duarte Machado. He's the co-medical director of the Chase Family Movement Disorder Center. And we're talking all about a condition, a neurodegenerative condition called ataxia. It affects about 150,000 people nationwide. Numbers not so big, but it's prevalent. It is a condition that does affect many people. And many people often go undiagnosed. Um, or misdiagnosed. So we want to talk right. a lot about this tonight. We want to answer your questions, so please feel free um, to ask your questions. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So first, yeah. I mean, I, this is not something I have heard of, and I'm sure maybe uh, a lot of other <coughs> folks um, have not, but what is ataxia? Yeah, so ataxia is a neurodegenerative disorder, meaning a disorder that affects the nervous system and gets worse over time, and it predominantly affects the cerebellum, which is a part of the brain that really coordinates uh, movement. And we have, um, I just want to show yeah. the model here of a brain, so actually show us what, where in the brain it affects. Uh, sure, so this is a life-size model of the brain, mm -hmm. and um, it sits within the, the head this way, so this is the, the front uh, frontal lobe, uh, occipital lobe, and then back here, this is the cerebellum. So these uh, dark uh, brown structures that sit in the back of the brain, um, cerebellum, different from the rest of the brain called the cerebrum, uh, this part is cerebellum. And, and now what does this control here, uh, this part of the brain? Yeah, so this affects? part of the brain, as we can see, um, is, if we put it upside down, we see it's closely associated with the brain stem and then the spinal cord. Uh, so the, it's connected to the spinal cord, which sends signals down to the rest of our body. Mm -hmm. So if there's dysfunction here, then it really affects uh, the cranial nerves that go to our eyes, so, to, so to our uh, swallow function, and then uh, signals from the brain to, that are involved in regulation of coordination are also impacted. So the signals essentially are not getting down, like they're not going anywhere, well, right? Well, they're, they're traveling down the, the spinal cord, but they're being uh, misinterpreted because this part of the brain would provide the fine tuning of response. So for example, for me to have uh, reached for this brain in the first place, that, that motion is put into place by the cerebrum mm -hmm. and for me to make sure that I don't overshoot or, or miss it entirely or knock it over, mm -hmm. I, it requires my cerebellum to uh, precisely go to target yep. and precisely execute the, the movement. Okay. So without that, that input from the cerebellum, the movement wouldn't be precise not, or coordinated. Got it. Okay, so I see yeah. how it would affect um, your movement, thus being a movement disorder. Correct. So yeah. what happens over time if someone has ataxia? What happens to this part of the brain cerebellum that it attacks? Does it shrink? What happens to it? Yeah, so um, there are many forms of ataxia, um, mm -hmm. many of which are genetically based and others are acquired mm -hmm. um, over a person's life. For those that are genetically based, uh, these are due to um, abnormalities within the uh, DNA that encode proteins, and those proteins then ultimately cause dysfunction of the cells of the cerebellum and cause them to work less well and ultimately degenerate. And that process is very gradual, mm -hmm. so this is a gradual uh, progressive disorder, and over time the cerebellum does shrink in size as those cells are, are lost. Uh, as further cell loss occurs, then more and more symptoms also become apparent. Can this part of the brain degenerate completely? Um, it, can, it can degenerate uh, substantially. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it, it depends on how long the person's had the condition, what type of ataxia specifically a person may and, have. And that varies in terms of how it progresses, right? It doesn't progress the same in everybody, That's right? That's right, yeah. So for the genetic forms, typically those are slowly progressive. Some of the acquired types of ataxia, such as a condition called multiple system atrophy, type C or type cerebellum, mm -hmm. cerebellar, in those patients, they have a very um, a fast course of s symptom progression. Mm -hmm. um, typically within um, a couple of years, mm -hmm. they go from, uh, those individuals may go from uh, walking and not having any trouble with speech or swallow function to having to use a, a wheelchair and having trouble swallowing. 
Yeah, and I want to talk about yeah. that. And, and they may not know why, and they may not be diagnosed um, with ataxia. And I, I really want mm -hmm. to um, for you to educate the audience tonight about sure. ataxia. And really, uh, if anybody has any questions, please ask them. Mm -hmm. um, because it's so important that if somebody has all of a sudden difficulty with speech or difficulty with gait, and they go to the doctor and, and they may just uh, attribute it to age or something other than ataxia, um, and it's a blood test that's that's how you diagnose this but mm -hmm. many doctors might not know to to have a specific blood test for ataxia that might just not even enter the equation that's right so uh, so what do you say to that how do you yeah. get that message out there yeah so at the very least on page, the the main message is that having trouble with balance and coordination is never a normal part of aging mm -hmm. that that uh, denotes that there is a dysfunction present and there are some things that can be done uh, by uh, primary care doctors and um, that can screen for um, very common causes of mm -hmm. balance and, and taxias. So things like vitamin deficiency. So vitamin E, for example, is, is a common cause for ataxia. And that's with a simple screening uh, blood test. Um, I, I think of it as a tier approach. So first tier are uh, assessing for things that are, can easily be tested for in the blood, like vitamin deficiencies. Uh, as we, as if those are negative, and especially if there's a family history, then that might indicate that the person has a genetic form. In which case, then they can be referred um, to myself or one of my colleagues, mm -hmm. who can uh, do a detailed um, history and exam to mm -hmm. determine what type of ataxia is most likely. Mm -hmm. um, in other words, if a person has another first degree relative with ataxia, then they may have an autosomal dominant type of ataxia a type called spinocerebellar, or SCA mm -hmm. ataxias. If uh, there's no family history, then they may have an autosomal recessive, meaning that uh, they may be the first person in their family to have um, an ataxia. To start um, it, yeah. And so through um, a process of elimination, we can do dedicated uh, genetic testing, for example, mm -hmm. to ultimately determine the type of ataxia. And I've seen that time and time again, where patients who've had symptoms for some time and even have a family member uh, with similar symptoms, but they've never actually been tested right, uh, to right. determine the precise type. And that's important because we have uh, information on the prognosis or, or long-term um, um, uh, issues that mm -hmm. can arise with the various types of ataxia. So identify which type of person has can help educate that person and allow us as clinicians to know how to best proceed with the treatment plan. Yeah, absolutely. Like if you have somebody, a patient coming into your office with these symptoms, but they, to the best of their knowledge, mm -hmm. they say, I don't think I have a family history or I don't have a family history. Right. Maybe they do and maybe just that person was never just diagnosed. That's Is right. Is that possible? I mean. That's right too, yeah. So sometimes um, the symptoms might be uh, subtle Mm -hmm. and uh, gradually progressive, so uh, the person that I'm seeing may not relate that those symptoms suffered by another family member are uh, related, related to what yeah. they're experiencing if right. their symptoms are a bit uh, more progressive or a bit uh, more apparent. Yeah, it could just be subtle enough not to make that connection. Right. We have a question from Scott. Is ataxia similar to myelitis? Thanks for that question, yeah. Scott. Yeah, so um, so Scott, those, those two conditions can present similarly because uh, myelitis uh, indicates that there is a dysfunction of the tracts within the spinal cord and those patients uh, would have difficulty with balance and coordination. Um, and typically, uh, myelitis is restricted to the spinal cord itself and not the cerebellum. Mm -hmm. So through imaging, then we can distinguish whether someone has trouble with balance due to myelitis versus due to an ataxia um, affecting the cerebellum specifically. And is that considered a movement disorder, myelitis? Um, if it's um, isolated, then uh, yes, but myelitis mm -hmm. can have many causes. So myelitis may also be due to demyelination, whereby there's a breakdown of the sheath that surrounds the individual nerve roots. And demyelination is seen in autoimmune and inflammatory conditions, so it could be virus-related or mm -hmm. due to an autoimmune condition like multiple sclerosis. So if it's 
due to one of those other causes, then uh, patients who have myelitis due to that might be seen by a neuroimmunologist rather than a movement disorder specialist. Got it, yeah. There's yeah. so many um, uh, specialists out there for That's all right. different types of conditions. So what are the specific treatments for ataxia? Yeah, so uh, currently there are specific therapies uh, such as uh, replacement therapies. So if there's vitamin E deficiency, then we do vitamin E. If it's coenzyme Q10 deficiency, then we replace with that versus nonspecific mm -hmm. treatment. So these are therapies that can be used by patients uh, regardless of the specific subtype of spinal cerebellar ataxy, for example, that they may have. Uh, there are currently four medications that are used in this regard. Um, amantadine, mm -hmm. um, Rilusol, uh, Buspirone, um, and, and uh, Shantix. Mm -hmm. These are all medications that are FDA approved for other purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, so for example, with Rilusol, it's, it's FDA approved for um, ALS, mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, being used off-label for ataxia mm -hmm. because there are um, small but good uh, trials, well-conducted trials, that indicate improvement of gait and balance mm -hmm. when these medications uh, are used. As of yet, there's no specific FDA-approved treatment for ataxia, mm -hmm. for, for certain types of ataxias, uh, but, and that's a, a, a hot area of research mm -hmm. um, currently, sure. uh, that there are medications. There's a Rilusol-like molecule mm -hmm. that is in clinical trials uh, for ataxia patients, specifically certain types, subtypes of ataxias. So the hope is that one day there will be a medication that's really specific for the ataxia subtype. Yeah. Um, and that's not uncommon in movement Where disorders. Where sort of like cross-generation of drugs that That's are used right. for multiple conditions. That's right. Yeah. Um, so I just want to make clear that the medication for ataxia that's mm -hmm. used for it sort of keeps the symptoms at bay. That's right. Yeah. Yep. So the medications I mentioned will help to uh, keep a person's gait and balance uh, as good as possible. Mm -hmm. So in the clinical trials, they study patients um, and measured their uh, balance and walking speed uh, with objective clinical measures, and they found that patients who took the medications had better uh, balance at the end of the trial, less falls compared to those who took placebo or, mm -hmm. or sugar tablets. Uh, so these medications are symptomatic uh, only for now, so there's no medication that's going to reverse right. or halt progression, mm -hmm. uh, but we do have uh, symptomatic-based therapies and it's always important to couple medications with the uh, services such as uh, physical, occupational, and speech therapies. I can't emphasize yeah. enough how important those are as well mm -hmm. in the armamentarium of treating this Especially disorder. Especially the repetitiveness of that. And if you keep doing it and doing it, you can sort of retrain the brain, right? To oh, so, absolutely. To, so this area, we were talking about the cerebellum that sort of depletes. Um, you can sort of compensate in other ways by repetition. Is That's that right? Absolutely, yeah. So uh, the therapist will help the person uh, maximize the function of other parts of the brain in helping to still initiate those same movements. And I've seen time and time again where patients undergo a course of therapy and they're, they, they're better at the end mm -hmm. and then months go by and they come back and see me and say, oh, I want to go back to physical therapy because I've noticed a decline already. Right. Uh, so then we send them back for like a refresher course. Um, and and, and that's important that. to do because, again, it's that repetitive nature mm -hmm. and, and teaching patients the proper techniques of doing things to maintain as good a balance as possible and to minimize fall risk. I mean, yeah. that's, that's really important I, th I think sometimes here. patients underestimate, you know, the, the rehabilitation part of it. And yes. I always say this, that that is just such a critical component really in anything, you know, because I think some people think, well, I feel better, I don't need that, or I don't have to go. But it's such a critical component mm. that um, by just the repetitiveness of it, um, it can improve your quality of life. Oh, definitely. And what I uh, love about what we've set up through the Hartford um, Healthcare Movie Disorder Center is really uh, this network that's available to us mm -hmm. of uh, the Hartford Healthcare Rehab Network, mm -hmm. where by depending on where a patient lives in the state of Connecticut, I can send them to their closest Hartford Healthcare Rehab Network location right. and feel assured that they're going to get um, the type of physical therapy that's neurologically based mm -hmm. uh, because the therapists 
have um, a It's probably sp very specific. Spread. Yeah, it is yeah, specific. The, and, the type of treatment right. that they're and the, and the therapists have uh, taught other therapists within the network, like, like spokes on the wheel, to teach them the techniques that are specific for patients with ataxia, right. which is very important. Um, so specific. It's really specific. Like Not all therapists are the same. Like patients with who have a, a tax and need a tax of specific therapy, I wouldn't send them to a rehab location that's focused on orthopedic based right. uh, treatments because right. they wouldn't get that type of neurological re-education right. that you've that been referring to. That precise rehabilitation that right. you need that's so important. That's um, right. You have something very exciting coming up on May 25th at the yes. Chase Family Movement Disorder Center yeah. in Vernon, the first ever support group mm -hmm. for ataxia right here in Connecticut. This is a big deal for um, this uh, subset of patients with ataxia because typically they would have to travel out of state to get something like this so and I know you're really excited about this so tell yeah. us a little bit about how this formed and how it all came about yeah so um, as I've started seeing more and more patients with ataxia I felt that it was an isolated group that mm -hmm. despite having symptoms head to toe when I'd ask um, you know if they were in touch with a family member who had this then they had some sense of this but otherwise it was very isolating to mm -hmm. them and there certainly was a need for something in Connecticut. When I looked on the National Taxi Foundation website, the closest group was in uh, New York, um, and they call it the Tri-City, uh, mm -hmm. Tri-State, tri mm -hmm. the Tri-State mm -hmm. Taxi Support Group. But patients, as I mentioned, with the taxi have difficulty with mobility, yeah. and so to get yeah, travel all the way to New York mm -hmm. uh, for a meeting is, is not p very feasible, and right. patients just uh, often wouldn't be able to do that. So. There was a uh, patient who, um, um, you know, took up the offer to say, "Well, I, I'm, I want to be charged with this, with starting a group," mm -hmm. and, and I'm very fortunate that she uh, wishes to do this. And she has a medical background in nursing and mm -hmm. and so um, in healthcare, and so I know that she'll be able to to do this mm -hmm. um, and. With support from the National Aid Taxi Foundation, uh, with providing educational resources and materials, then we hope that this first group will um, help uh, bring together individuals uh, for this type of support to uh, give them the resources mm -hmm. uh, that are available locally and nationally, um, as well as discussion of uh, clinical trial opportunities, for mm -hmm. example, and really. Uh, even things that are helpful on a day-to-day -day basis. So how to make uh, their lives easier through mm -hmm. even assistive or adaptive, adaptive technologies they, that they may not be aware of even exist. Yeah, I, you know, it's, it's a way to connect and it can be a very lonely place. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have a condition, a uh, neurodegenerative condition such as this and your quality of life is affected and your your gait is affected, your your speech is affected, it can be a very lonely place That's and right. not have anybody to talk to mm -hmm. or to reach out to. So uh, so this is exciting. This yeah. is, um, uh, and, and kudos to you for, for bringing that here to Connecticut um, because that is sure to help many patients out there um, who may have a taxi, who've been diagnosed, uh, right. or who may have the symptoms of it. That's right. So we thank you. Thank yeah. you so much. It's always a privilege to have you here, and yeah, we thanks. always learn something when you're here. So we well, thank thanks you. so much. And we thank you for sharing a little bit of your time yeah. with us tonight. Um, don't forget about that class. It's uh, May 25th at the Chase Family Movement Disorder Center. That is in Vernon. Yeah. Um, you can call 1-855-HHC-HERE for more information about that support group. So, again, thanks for sharing your time yeah. with us, and we'll see you soon.